At this point in the course, we've uh, covered some of the history of psychology and looked at some of the precursors in philosophy and some of the history of both experimental and clinical psychology. We've looked at some of the methodologies that are used in psychology, both the quantitative methodologies of experimentation and correlational observation, and uh, some of the qualitative methodologies that are used as well. And then we had a lecture on evolutionary theory and how that might impact our thinking about human behavior. Today, we want to uh, look at another conception of who we are. And this is a very old one in psychology. This is Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic theory. And psychoanalytic theory has had a major impact on psychology. Today, psychoanalytic theory is not used nearly as much as it originally was. And in fact, even the, uh, the therapy based upon psychoanalytic theory, psychoanalysis, is not in as much use as it was originally in psychology. And some of my colleagues, in fact, are surprised that I'm still lecturing on psychoanalytic theory. But I think it is an important theory to think about. After all, if you ask the average person, name one psychologist, they'll name Sigmund Freud. That's the one that immediately comes to mind, even more so than Joyce Brothers and Dr. Phil. Uh, Sigmund Freud is somebody that they remember. And when I tell people I'm a psychologist, they'll uh, immediately jump to the conclusion I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm somehow intimately linked with Sigmund Freud, even though it could be uh, my training is far distant from psychoanalytic theory. But I think psychoanalytic theory over and beyond that is also important because it's affected many of our social institutions. And in fact, some of the basic tenets of psychoanalytic theory are tenets we still believe in in many of our social institutions. In fact, when I start to talk about psychoanalytic theory in my classes, I often come in and I say, all right, I've decided to run for governor, and I have a new plan, and we're going to save a lot of money and move money from the prisons over to education. And the way we're going to do that, it's a very simple plan. I've decided that we ought to beat our prisoners whenever they misbehave. And the punishment will cause them to behave properly because nobody likes to get beat. So this sounds like a good idea to me. So that's my new plan. We're going to beat the prisoners until they behave properly and then we'll allow them to go back out in society and, and empty out our prisons. I say, Why, do, what do you think of that plan? And they, of course, immediately jumped to the ethical considerations and said, well, you can't do that. That's, that's inhumane. I say, well, ignore that for a minute. Let's just talk about whether or not that would work. Do you think it would work? And they say, well, no, I really don't think so. I say, well, why? I mean, if you were beat, wouldn't you decide to behave properly so you could stop being beaten? And they say, well, it sounds right, but I don't think so. I don't think it would work. Well, why wouldn't it work? Well, I don't know. People just don't think that way. Well, how do they think? What's causing their behavior if that's not the case? Well, there's, there's something that's kind of beyond their control that's causing their behavior. Well, what is that? And sometimes they even come up with the word, well, there's something at the unconscious level that's doing this. And they have immediately jumped to a Freudian concept here. That is his key concept, in fact, in psychoanalytic theory, is that our behavior is driven at the unconscious level. And the unconscious level is one of the most important uh, drivers of our behavior. And if you want to correct behavior, you have to do it at the unconscious level. You can't do it at the conscious, rational level and get people to make rational decisions because part of this is out of their control. That's a very Freudian concept, as we'll see. So I think psychoanalytic theory has been very important uh, for our social institutions, our penal systems, our mental institutions, and so forth. And we make a lot of assumptions about this and, and when we're trying to correct people's behavior. Okay, let's uh, go back and talk a little bit then about Freud and his life. We're going to talk some about that. Then we'll talk more about the unconscious level. And finally, we'll talk about the, the three components of our personality. Uh, this is a personality theory, after all, and there are a number of personality theories. But this is one of the, the ones that uh, is most cited in psychology. Sigmund Freud um, was born in Moravia, which is now Czechoslovakia, back in 1856. 
And uh, he was born to a, a Jewish family. His father was a wool merchant and uh, was not very successful. In fact, uh, when he was four years old, his father lost his job and they had to move to Vienna to try to get another job. And they were not in real good circumstances either. His, this was his father's second marriage. He had two boys by his first marriage. And by his second marriage, there were uh, eight kids from that marriage. So they had 10 kids in this family. Um, but Freud, uh, to his credit, Sigmund Freud, went on and got a good education and then uh, tried to decide what to become. And as a Jewish boy, he didn't have much choice. Uh, if he wanted to be in a, a professional in those days, about the only option was to become a doctor. So that's what he decided to do. And he went to medical school and got a degree, a medical degree, and became a medical doctor. His particular specialty was neurology. He was studying the nervous system. Originally, uh, sort of the organic basis of things like neurosis and other neurological disorders. Um, but he became increasingly interested in non-organic, in the psychological roots of neurosis and other uh, nervous system disorders. And uh, he uh, was dealing with a, a set of usually middle-class to upper-middle-class women in his practice and discovering that uh, many of them had what was classified as hysteria. Now, this is a kind of old classification. We'll mention this again when we talk about classification systems a little bit late in a later lecture. But it's uh, now called conversion disorder, and it was considered to be a, uh, a disease solely of women. That's why it's named uh, hysteria after hystera, which is the uterus. And so it was expected that women had this, but men did not have it. And a conversion disorder or hysteria, uh, some part of the body quits working. And uh, it's considered to be a conversion because it's converted a psychological problem into a physical problem. So this may uh, cause blindness or the inability to hear, or perhaps the left arm is paralyzed or something like that. And they can't find any organic neurological reason for this, but it apparently has a psychological cause to it. So those are the kinds of problems he was interested in and trying to solve those uh, using psychology. And very early in his practice, he discovered that there was a fellow named Charcot, Jean Charcot, who was practicing in Paris and using hip hypnosis in his, uh, in his practice. And so he went for a year to study with Charcot in Paris, and he found Charcot giving all sorts of demonstrations. Let me give you an example. Uh, there's a, Charcot was in a room and he had an audience and he brought a woman down and put her into a hypnotic trance and then told her that when the clock struck one, she would get up and open the window. And he took her out of the trance, had her sit down there, and sure enough, when the clock struck one, she went over and opened up the window and sat back down again. And then Charcot said, now, why did you open the window? And she said, well, I, I thought it was kind of hot and stuffy in here and I thought we needed some air and that's the reason. Well, Freud was impressed, number one, that he got her to open the window, and number two, that she had no recollection of why she had opened the window, that in fact she rationalized why she opened the window. She already had behaved in a particular way, so she used her rational mind to try to uh, come up with a reason for her behavior. He also discovered that Charcot could simulate conversion disorder or hysteria in, in uh, people who didn't have it by putting them under hypnosis. And he could get somebody, for example, under the hypnotic uh, state to have their left arm become useless while they were in the hypnotic state. So again, he thought that there might be psychological origins at the unconscious level for this kind of disorder. And this was an important breakthrough for him. So he went back and opened up a private practice. He practiced with a fellow named Brewer for a while and uh, they both were using hypnosis in their practice to try to get uh, at this hysteria problem. And that seemed to work okay. He would put somebody into a hypnotic state and then have them try to talk through their problems. But uh, there were uh, difficulties with that as well. He didn't think that people really confronted their problems as well in a hypnotic state. So in fact, he, w he moved on to other methods and thought that maybe it was the talking part of the thing 
that was helping them solve their problems more than being in a hypnotic state. So he eventually did away with the hypnosis altogether and just started talking therapy, which is psychoanalysis as we know it today, where there are things like free association that we'll talk about a little bit more later. Okay, so that's what uh, sort of the early career of Freud. And if we look at uh, the unconscious a little bit uh, more uh, clearly, let's... Uh, Let's envision what this might look like. And one way that people do this is to imagine an iceberg. So we have this big mass of ice that's sitting in the water. And below the water line is about 90% of this iceberg. And above the water line is about 10% of the, the iceberg. And the way this is used is the, the part below the water line is generally conceptualized as the unconscious. And the part above the water line, that 10%, is the conscious level. The water line represents kind of a censoring mechanism that keeps us from figuring out what's going on at the unconscious level, prevents you from getting to the unconscious level. Now, there are other variations of this. There's uh, the, the pre-conscious, which sometimes comes into play. That's a level where you can get to the pre-conscious level if you work hard enough, but it's something that's not currently in your conscious level. But we'll keep it fairly simple and just pretty much talk about the unconscious level. Um, the unconscious level, as we talked about, is what primarily drives our behavior, and we don't have direct access to it. And so there's a problem if you want to correct behavior, if you want to change behavior, if the primary driver of behavior is what's happening at the unconscious level, and you don't have direct access to it, how do you get to it to do something about it? And that's kind of a conundrum that, that Freud had to, uh, to figure out how to do that, and that's where he came up with psychoanalytic theory. Okay, at the unconscious level, we have things kind of seething down there, and these are due to various kinds of energy that we have. And these are instinctual kinds of things. So Freud was not a blank slate theorist at, theorist at all. He thought that there were, in fact, instincts that were there from birth. And one of these instincts is a life force or a life instinct that is sometimes called the energy from that, called the libido, or the libido, I've heard it pronounced. And the libido is this life force which is largely made up of sexual energy. Now that shocked people when he said that. You've got to picture the times. We're talking the late 1800s, a Victorian age in Vienna, Austria, where women were dressed with their collars going up, up to their necks and their skirts down to their shoes. Uh, people would certainly never even talk about sex in polite society in those days. And here was Freud suggesting that a newborn baby is a bundle of sexual and aggressive energy. You can imagine people's shock at that. In fact, this fellow Brewer, he, who he had originally started to practice with, eventually became so uncomfortable with the notion that sex was so important that he dissociated himself from Freud and went his own way. But for Freud, this was very important, this life force that was uh, energizing much of our behavior. Later on, in about the 1920s, Freud published a book that talked about the death instinct as well. And uh, this is a bit more controversial, came a little bit later in Freud's career. Freud lived a long time. He lived into the, to the late 1930s and eventually died in London, uh, where he had gone the last year of his life because of Nazi uh, persecution. And he died of uh, jaw cancer, where he had had, uh, you've always seen the picture with Freud with the cigar in his mouth or in his hand in almost every picture. Well, he got cancer of the jaw and had 33 operations and eventually died of this. Uh, at any rate, Freud made contributions throughout his life, and this death uh, instinct is one of the later contributions. Um, he, he thought that when life originally came about, it was quite tenuous, and there was a life instinct to keep it going, and there was a death instinct that might take it back to being an inanimate object instead of an animate object. And that that death instinct has stayed with us through evolutionary history into uh, today, and so humans still have some of this death instinct. And that's part of the reason, perhaps, why people commit suicide. However, usually this death instinct, the life instinct kind of overcomes it, but it's still there, and so at the unconscious level, it's kind of seething around trying to figure out what to do if we can't kill the, 
kill the owner, let's figure out something else to do, and it leads to aggressive kinds of behavior toward other people. So again, he was not a noble, savage kind of person. He thought that we were all basically quite aggressive and that we had to sort of cap this aggression and hold it down at the unconscious level, and that's part of the source of this kind of conflict that occurs. So all of this is happening at the, at the unconscious level. Um, now, he wasn't the first to actually talk about the unconscious level. Others have, have done that as well. I was wandering in a bookstore some number of years ago and found a book by Maudsley called Body and Mind. And this book was published in 1870. And you remember Freud, we're talking about kind of turn of the century here. So this is 25 or 30 years ahead of Freud. And if you look in this book, Maudsley uh, says some things. Let me just read just a, a, about a paragraph of this book. He says, the fact that memory is accompanied by consciousness in the supreme centers does not alter the fundamental nature of the organic processes that are the condition of it. The more sure and perfect indeed memory becomes, the more unconscious it becomes. And when an idea or mental state has been completely organized, it is reviewed without consciousness and takes its part automatically in our mental operations, just as a habitual movement does in our bodily activity. We perceive in operation here the same law of organization of conscious acquisitions as unconscious power, which we observed in the functions of the lower nerve centers. Later he says, accordingly in the brain that is not disorganized by injury or disease, the organic registrations are never actually forgotten, but endure while life lasts. No wave of oblivion can efface their characters. Consciousness, it is true, may be impotent to recall them, but a fever, a blow on the head, a poison in the blood, a dream, the agony of drowning, the hour of death rending the veil between our present consciousness and these inscriptions, will sometimes call vividly back in a momentary flash and call back too with all the feelings of the original experience, much that seems to have vanished from the mind forever. So he's talking about the unconscious level there. And that was kind of a revelation to me that it wasn't Freud who invented this. Um, and in fact, I found another book I was just reading uh, last week in preparation for this lecture on mesmerism from, the 18, from 1892. And in this book, I was reading along, and they were suddenly talking about the ego. As we'll see in a minute, the ego is part of the personality, according to Freud. And I thought he made that up. But apparently, that was being talked about as well. In science, there's a thing called the zeitgeist, which is a notion that sort of a lot of people have the same kind of thought about the same time versus a great man theory or a great person theory of science which uh, says that one person was responsible for something. This sort of indicates that there was a zeitgeist going on and Freud was picking up these concepts and we certainly give him credit for it, but he was not the only one talking about things like the unconscious. All right. Um, let's talk about the fact that psychoanalytic theory is a deterministic theory. By deterministic, what we mean here is that Everything you do is determined. There's a cause for everything you do. Not only your actions, but also your thoughts and your feelings. That there is a, a root cause for this. We may not know what the cause is, particularly if it's at the unconscious level. But that, in fact, is the goal. If we want to change human behavior or change your thoughts or your feelings, we need to understand what the cause was. Um, so, in fact, if you go to the grocery store, and you're trying to buy all the things that you need and you forget the bread. Freud would not say that's an accident or a slip of the mind. He would say there was a reason you forgot the bread. There's no accidents. In fact, you may be familiar with the, the term a Freudian slip. When people misspeak, Freud would say, well, they didn't misspeak as an accident. It wasn't just a phonological problem, that there was a deeper problem that was causing this. There's a story told of a fellow who was a, a typesetter and typeset the headlines on a newspaper. And uh, this, this widely decorated general had come back from the war, from the front lines, and, and uh, they wrote a, a, uh, an article about him being very positive about him. But the, the fellow who was doing the typesetting didn't think much of this general. And he wrote the headlines and, and miswrote the headlines and said, the battle-scared general returns from the front. It was supposed to be the battle-scarred general returns from the front. 
And the newspaper was just very upset about this, and so they, were, or they printed a retraction the next day, and uh, they let the same guy write the headlines, unfortunately, and he said, the bottle-scarred general returned from the front. <laughs> the point is, it wasn't an accident in the first place. There was a root cause, and that root cause ca uh, 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 produced the second problem <laughs> as well. All right, so this is a deterministic kind of thing, that everything that you do, that there's a, a reason for it. Okay, and we already talked about how the unconscious is one of the, uh, the, the fundamental kinds of things in our society and that we make a lot of decisions in society as if the unconscious were true. Now beyond that, we want to talk some about the structure of the, of the unconscious and the structure of the personality. And Freud says that there are really three concepts there. Now these are not real entities. You can't cut open the brain and find the superego over here and the ego over here, but these are concepts that underlie the, 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 uh, the personality. Um, the first of these is the id. And the id is said to operate on a pleasure principle. And again, we go to the fact that we are not a blank slate. The id is built in. The newborn baby is carrying id around already uh, at, at birth. And so the, the newborn baby, in fact, pleasure is the whole source of, of uh, what that, that child wants to do. Doesn't care about anybody else. Wants to get all the milk it can get. Wants to get all the pleasure it can get. Very hedonistic kind of, kind of baby. If we were all id and we were unchecked by any other part of our personality, we'd do whatever we wanted to do. There are no wrongs and rights for the id. It just does what feels good. And so if you're sitting there and you like the uh, person's pencil or the sitting next to you, you think it's better than yours, go ahead and grab it. It's your pencil. It makes you happy. Go ahead and take it. Or if the person sitting next to you is an attractive person, you might grab that person. Feels good. That's what the id says to do, if unchecked by everything else. You can imagine the chaos in our society if we were all just id. In fact, people who have uh, psychopathologies of various kinds, psychopathic personalities, uh, are one way to, to talk about it is that they're all id and they're not properly checked by the other parts of their personality. All right, so it operates on the pleasure principle, tries to satisfy itself, and that's about all we have there. Okay, that's built in. Then shortly after birth, our parents start telling us little rules that we have to follow. And other people, our daycare people, television, everybody starts telling us rules. What are the, the do's and don'ts of life? And that begins to form our conscience. And in psychoanalytic theory, that's called the superego. So the superego is much like our conscience. It contains all the rules that our parents try to teach us. And it doesn't get along very well with the id, obviously. The id says, hey, hey, that'd be fun. Let's go do that. And the superego says, oh, no, 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 that's against the rules. You can't do that. And the superego has at its disposal a, a weapon, which is a fairly powerful weapon, and that's guilt. Go ahead and do that if you want to, but you're going to feel really bad because I'm going to make you feel bad with this guilt if you go do that. Now, it's not all bad stuff the superego has. It also has pride and satisfaction if you do the right thing. But that guilt is a very powerful kind of thing and keeps the id somewhat in check. It doesn't make the id happy, but it keeps it in check, and that's part of the source of this conflict that's seething at the, un at the unconscious level all the time that we have to deal with and what Freud was trying to deal with. So that's the superego, sometimes said to operate on a moral principle. So these are the morals, these are the rules, the do's and don'ts of life. Now there's a third part of the personality as well, and that's the ego. And the ego is really required because if all we had was the id and the superego, and these, these guys are fighting all the time down there, we're going to be very unstable. And sometimes we're going to be over here doing things that give us pleasure. And sometimes we're going to be over here feeling really guilty. And so we sort of vacillate and swing back and forth, and nobody knows what we're going to do from time to time. Well, the ego comes along, and the ego operates on a reality principle. What's the real world like? What can we get away with? Kind of acts like the referee between the superego and the id and tries to get them to get along. Again, they're not happy with it, 
But the ego allows, says, okay, id, you want to do this. Superego says, you can't do that. What can we do here to settle this, to mediate between these two? What can we do to get some happiness but not break the rules too much either? So that's kind of a function of the ego. Uh, now, as we, as we get older and the ego gets stronger, again, the ego is not there from birth. This is something that we learn as we experience the environment, we move around, we learn about reality and what we can get away with and what we can't get away with. And the ego gets stronger. And ego strength is a good thing in terms of being a psychological concept. The stronger the ego, the more well-developed you are as a person, and the stronger your personality is. So after a while, you don't have to mediate every little conflict. What you end up with is sort of an image of who you are. So I have this image of David Martin in my mind about what this guy named David Martin does. And whenever I'm confronted by something that my id telling me, boy, it'd be great to go do that, wouldn't it? And my superego saying, well, you know, that's really kind of against the rules. I have this picture of who I am that I compare these things to and say, what would David Martin do in this case? And as I get a, a stronger ego, a stronger self-image, that picture gets stronger and it allows me to be much more consistent in my behavior. So I now can kind of solve this problem and at least outwardly appear that things are fairly placid. Uh, even though at the unconscious level, again, things are not so placid, there are still these seething kinds of forces against one another uh, caused by the life, uh, kind of the life instinct and the death instinct that are sort of fighting with each other, the death instinct that can't kill the organism so that the, the death instinct is causing aggression. And then you have the, the id who wants to, uh, to uh, use this aggression to go against other people to feel good. And you have the super ego saying, no, you, you can't do that and we'll give you a lot of guilt. And you have the ego trying to, trying to referee this whole sort of mess that's going on down there at the same time. So you can imagine the kinds of problems that you have at the unconscious level. And so that was Freud's conception of this whole thing and what's going on. And if you have all of these problems at the unconscious level and you have all of these conflicts, how are you going to solve the problems? And that's where he came up with the basic tenets of uh, psychoanalysis. And uh, he, with psychoanalysis, with things like free association, with dream analysis, uh, with some projective tests and that kind of thing, what the, the whole purpose of that was to break through this censoring mechanism and try to be able to get down there at the unconscious level and from time to time get a little inkling. You could never be sure what's down there, but you get inklings about this. And that's why psychoanalysis takes such a long time because you just get little bits and pieces from time to time and try to build what's at the unconscious level to understand these conflicts that are going on down there. And so it's uh, quite a complex problem to, uh, to try to figure out what's going on at the unconscious level. Now we've been over the rudiments today of psychoanalysis, but it goes into more detail as well. Um, there are certain stages. It is a, a theory that has developmental stages to it. Uh, as you can imagine, because we start out as an id, uh, that, that would be a different stage than after we add a little superego to it and a little ego to it. And so we have these psychosexual developmental stages. And we'll talk more about that in the next lecture. We'll also talk more about how you deal with the kinds of conflicts that are going on at the unconscious level, because these conflicts at the unconscious level are, are quite uh, upsetting to the person. And we have to have ways of coping with these kinds of conflicts. And we do that, and we call them defense mechanisms. We'll talk a little bit about that in the next lecture as well. So today, I've given you a little background in terms of who Sigmund Freud was how he came up with the notion of the unconscious, how important the unconscious was to psychoanalytic theory, and also to our thinking about how uh, our social institutions work. It's really the underpinnings of a lot of the, the ways we've designed our social systems. And we've also talked some about the parts of our unconscious and our personality and how they are in constant conflict. So next time we'll go into a little bit more detail about this. Thank you.